if you've got any questions at all during the, our conversations this evening, please put them in the chat and we'll leave space at the end of the, of the session and uh, for questions to our speakers. And I hope there will be lots because we know so little about this topic. I hope you've got loads of questions um, and uh, it'll help us to sort of think it all through as well. So great to see everybody. Um, okay, so what we, we do know, obviously, that curlew are declining quite dramatically in certain particular, very definitely in farmland, but also more generally. Um, we know that the main drivers are um, uh, farming, intensive farming techniques, such as silage cutting, high levels of predation, habitat loss due to activities such as uh, forestry and development, all those things we know. But there is increasing anecdotal evidence coming out of the curly projects around the UK that are finding chicks that haven't been predated, um, that haven't been mown over, but, and they seem otherwise healthy, but they've died. And people are beginning to ask questions, could it be that in certain environments they're starving? There just isn't enough food around in, the term of, in terms of insects and the chicks only eat insects. So what is this something that we should be looking at more carefully? And when uh, we decided to try to find out and put this webinar on, we did a bit of research and realized we really don't know much about it. Um, and so we thought we'd do a webinar, bring together people a really excellent panel tonight. It's it's really wonderful to have our three speakers uh, to try to pick apart what we do know and more importantly, what we don't know and how can we go about finding out more about what we don't know. So I'll just introduce our speakers. Each speaker will give a short presentation of no more than 10 minutes. Otherwise they'll uh, get a sort of metaphorical cattle prod coming through the screen <laughs> or something like that. Um, and so that would uh, take us you know, about half an hour or so to do that. Then the, then we'll have a, a discussion between ourselves, sort of exploring what the speakers have, have raised. And then we'll go to your questions in the chat. So please feel free to put as many questions as you want to in the chat. Um, okay, so our panelists tonight. First up, we have Rachel Taylor, who is a senior scientist, at the uh, or head of science actually, at BTO in Wales. Rachel and I have known each other for quite a long time, in fact, I got to know Rachel on my curly walk in 2016 because she very kindly put me up as I went through North Wales and um, and just then was doing some very exciting work, just starting your wonderful, quite pioneering work on tracking what curly do in the breeding season and how they were using the environment around where they were nesting. And that has revealed all kinds of fascinating stuff, which I'm sure will be a part of what you're talking about tonight, Rachel. Uh, Dave Goulson, most people will know who Dave Goulson is. Dave is a professor at the University of Sussex. Um, and uh, what would you say, are you a, an ecologist? Is that your specific title, Dave? Um, ecologist, entomologist, bee botherer. <laughs> bee botherer, that will go with that. Um, Dave has written some incredibly good books. Um, some of my favourites, Sting in the Tail and Buzz in the Meadow, I think on top five nature books that I've read, and um, Silent Earth, which I'm listening to as an audio book at the moment, but I have to do it in sections because I find it so upsetting, but it's um, excellent. And uh, Wietse de Han. Wietse is did, done a, did an MSc project at the University of Groningen, in the very northeast of, sorry if I didn't say it right, Wietse, in the very northeast of the Netherlands. And uh, Wietse and I met last year when Curlew Action did a trip to the Netherlands to look at the environments that Curlew are nesting in there. And um, he turned up in a, in a very green silage field, uh, chasing chicks around and looking at their poo. And, um, and is studied, kind of what, what what these birds are eating in such a hostile environment and his presentation will tell us more about that. So it's going to be as an exploration. This is not telling everybody uh, what we know. This is saying this is a really interesting area we need to know an awful lot more about. So I'll hand over to Rachel to kick us off. And Rachel's got a presentation on how curlews are feeding during their year, particularly in their breeding season. Thanks, Rachel. So my, my overview essentially is that 
we don't know very much about some parts of the curlew's lifestyle and some of it they are surprisingly generalist and my understanding of what curlew eat comes from several years of handling them um, taking swabs of the insides of their mouths in the breeding season for genetic samples and from studying the behavior of adults so i'm going to give you a quick gallop through what we what we know and what we don't know and i'll start by saying when we're studying curlew using tracking information, we can get some relatively refined information about where they go and where they spend most of their time, even in relatively complex landscapes. Um, in this picture, I was downloading some data from curlew carrying tracking tags. And what we see when we start looking at those data sets is the curlew are very picky. So this is data from breeding adults. Um, it's a comparison of a landscape with a landscape overlaid with a whole bunch of tracking data. Each of the different blues is a different individual bird. And at this scale, you can already see that the birds are using different bits of the landscape to different extents. In some places, they're spending lots and lots of time. In other places, they're spending almost no time at all. And that their behaviour overlaps very strongly with each other. Now, if we zoom in, they're still very picky. So here you've got a zoom in on a field on the right hand side and half of that field is used very intensively by feeding curlew and the other half is barely touched at all. On the left hand side you can see that that applies not only to farmland but also the darker green areas which are shallow bog um, and wet grassland and again in some places the birds are spending considerable amounts of time and in other places they barely touch the ground at all. And this is real. If you observe curlew in the field, you can see that they're very selective, even at these really fine spatial scales. So it's not habitat that's driving curlew behaviour, it's something else. And very probably for an adult curlew, what they're doing is making decisions about how accessible food is and therefore how much time they want to spend in a particular place feeding. So we could think about the diet of an adult curlew from as, as a, a list of choices. Curlew essentially will eat anything that they can fit in their mouths and that they have access to. It's mostly but not all invertebrate food. Certainly on farmland it's almost all, it's likely all invertebrates. Um, obviously in the winter they're on intertidal, they feed on a lot of crustaceans as well, uh, marine worms and crustaceans. They have been known to eat vertebrates um, in the form of mud skippers in some countries. So for an adult curlew, can I catch it? Can I fit it in my mouth? Is it worth the effort? So it does have to be nutritious. They don't eat any plants at all. Um, the gape size of a curlew is big enough just about to swallow the end of your thumb. So that's my index. Will it go into my mouth? Is it the size of my thumb? Yes, it will go down an adult curlew's mouth. Is it accessible? Now we have to break that question up a little bit because the question there is can I catch it? Adult curlew don't feed in the air so they might take flies if they're resting but actually they take a lot of terrestrial invertebrates and that's things that live on the ground like beetles and things that live in the ground like worms and larvae. So they might be surface picking small beetles, um, they're a, a common part of curlew diet, particularly in intensive grassland, in grazed sheep pastures after the sheep have been in for a couple of weeks, you get an emergence of small ground beetles and the curlew will feed on those. They also take near surface species and what we mean by near surface here is how far in can the curlew get its bill and therefore what can it reach. So we're talking here about conventional earthworms, garden worms, we're talking about larvae, um, leather jackets are a, a common food. But here one of the considerations is can the bird get its beak into the ground? So is it compacted to the point where it can't probe in and does it have to pick on the surface or is it uncompacted soil or shallow bog or sphagnum where it can probe to the full depth of its beak. And there the question is, is it within reach? Female curlew are bigger than males, so their probing depth is about 10 centimetres. For males it's around seven. And that can be important in some habitats. Um, there's a theory that on the intertidal in the winter, this difference helps the two sexes not compete with each other for food where they're probing in relatively soft substrates. Females can eat things that are slightly bigger and slightly further down. 
So from photographic evidence, you can see here there's a curly one on the right probing right down into its to face depth. And I've seen them do this in terrestrial habitats as well. Um, the bird on the left is eating a crab. So they can eat quite crunchy things, but again, small enough to get into the mouth. In um, grassland habitats, in soft enough soil, again, they can probe right to their, till their faces are almost underground. I've seen a curly with sphagnum at eye level. And here they're going to be taking anything they can overpower, but they will take a lot of earthworms if they're available. So they're going to be responsive to what invertebrates are living in these farmed agricultural habitats. But chicks are different. And we have to remember that a chick can't do what an adult curlew does. It sounds very obvious, but curlew don't feed their chicks at all. They guard them, they walk around with them, but they don't find food for them. And a curlew chick, when it comes out of the egg, doesn't have a curlew's bill. It has a relatively soft bill and a very short one. So they're not capable of probing into soil. And what they're going to be eating is smaller things because they're physically smaller, but also accessible things if you can't probe. So they're going to be picking small invertebrates, resting flies, particularly in the cool parts of the day when things like mosquitoes are on the vegetation, surface dwelling beetles, but smaller and less crunchy ones than the adults. As they mature, the bill gets gradually longer. So here, this, this, this bird can't stick that bill into the ground at all, but it can begin to turn things over. As they grow, look how slowly the bill grows compared to the growth of rate of the rest of the bird. So they're surface picking through most of the pre-fledging period because they just don't have the bill to probe. They've also got relatively soft bones around the face at that stage. Here, the birds are almost fledging. So they're old enough to have been ringed. They're probably less than a week away from fledging. These are birds from one of the head starting projects. Look at the bill. It's still not a curlew bill at that stage. And in fact, when they fledge, they, the bill is still very noticeably shorter than an adult bill, certainly for a month or so. Then they get to adult size and they fit into this category of I will eat anything I can get into my mouth and that I can get access to. And incidentally, the tip of a curlew's bill is incredibly sensitive. It's like a fingertip. So when they probe into the ground, they're actually feeling around for something moving and they'll catch things based on being able to feel for them, not just stab them. And my last point here, I think is going to lead very nicely onto the other speakers and I'm really happy about that. This was a review published in 2018, and it was a review of interventions being applied uh, across the whole of Europe. So these are farmland interventions intended to support breeding waders on, on grassy habitats. So not only curlew, but lapwing, um, golden plover and other, other species like that. And if you look across the interventions here, they're, they're common to most of the schemes, changing to mowing, changing to grazing, differences in how agrochemicals are applied and which chemicals are used and how much, changes in water management. And the key thing to note here is that the interventions that are effective at increasing populations of grassland species, grassland ground nesting waders, are all interventions that are going to be very beneficial for invertebrates. We know that invertebrates respond to agrochemicals. They, we know that they respond to grazing patterns. We know that they respond to available water. And that's all I have to say because I've managed to keep it to 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, oh, that's marvellous. Um, well done. Very good timing there, Rachel. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, lots and lots of questions already for me about that, but we will now. And, and the curlews that you have looked at, Rachel, what environments and specifically that you've worked on tend to be more upland areas? No, I've worked on both upland and lowland. Um, they're not high intensity productive grassland, although that type of grassland is available in the landscape. And adult curlew certainly feed in very intensive reseeded silage fields a lot of the time, you know, particularly um, incubating females will nip out and stuff themselves in intensive grassland before they go back and, and return to incubation. 
but the habitats I've seen them in include everything from intensive grassland all the way through to unimproved shallow bog habitat. Yeah, right. So they're feeding all over the place. So that, that's a really important point to make, isn't it? Did, and one question, do they eat berries? I heard they did eat berries. They, up in the uplands in the breeding season, they might take crowberries and so on. I've never seen them take crowberries and certainly crowberries, bog cranberry and other things are available in the habitats I saw them in, but I never saw them doing it. When you when you swab an adult curlew's mouth in the breeding season, there's almost always a lot of mud in there. So oh, they're they're pulling out and eating things that are muddy. They have been seen washing invertebrates in, in, in winter in intertidal habitats, pulling out a worm and then apparently rinsing it in water before swallowing it. So this is an old cookbook thing that from quite a long time ago, and they said eat curlew, shoot your curlew when they come off the moors um, down into the into the estuaries and so on for the winter. Eat them, eat them then because the flesh is sweetest because they've been eating berries. That's not what you've ever observed. That's no, I, I imagine it's more to do with salt balance, to be honest. <laughs> Amazing. OK, thanks, Rachel. So we'll go now on to Dave Goulson and Dave is going to give us an overview of what's happening to our insects. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I enjoyed your comment about these chicks that were healthy apart from being dead. Uh, that's rather poignant, really. Anyway, sorry. Um, so I'm going to be talking about insects for 10 minutes, um, the relevance of which is hopefully fairly obvious, but uh, will become more so. Um, so Insects make up the, I'm just going to give a bit of general preamble about insects and then uh, talk about what's happening to their populations and that, the effects on the food supply. Um, so as a little intro, insects make up about 70% of species on our planet. Um, they're incredibly diverse. We've named about 1.1 million species um, and it's estimated that they're, um, maybe something like another 5 million, perhaps even as many as 10 million more species that we haven't even discovered yet, which is really kind of mind boggling and rather cool. Um, so they're everywhere on land and in fresh water doing all sorts of things. And a lot of those things are really important um, and often not very glamorous, taken for granted if anyone thinks about them at all. But things like dung beetles clearing away and recycling the nutrients in cow pats and burying beetles. And, Insects are great recyclers generally, and they help to control pests, they help to keep the soil healthy, they distribute the seeds, they, they do a whole bunch of stuff, most of which nobody pays any attention to at all. Um, the one thing that I think people are aware of these days is, uh, is this, they, they're of course important pollinators. Um, if, if curlews did eat cranberries, they would probably be pollinated by bumblebees, but it sounds as if that's not a big deal. But 87% of all plant species uh, on the planet are pollinated by some kind of insect. Uh, not always a bee, it might be a moth, a butterfly, a wasp, a fly, a beetle. But between them, they make sure that most of our plants produce seeds and continue to exist. And of course, there's a direct human link. Something like three quarters of the crops we grow wouldn't give a full harvest without being pollinated by some kind of insect. So, so insects are obviously uh, important in terms of all these ecosystem services they provide. And of course, they're really important as, as a, one of the lower layers of the food chain. Um, uh, a huge number of bird species feed partly or often primarily, sometimes exclusively on insects of one type or another, as do, of course, lots of other things, um, things like bats and lots of reptiles and amphibians like frogs and toads and newts and so on. Uh, freshwater fish, trout and salmon uh, and so on and so on. So um, if, if the insects decline, then it seems logical to expect all of these other creatures to decline. And, and sadly, insects are declining. Um, I should preempt this next rather depressing section um, by saying that there are huge knowledge gaps. We have no data for most insects and for huge regions of the world in terms of kind of long-term monitoring. Um, uh, 
so for example, we have, we have basically no long-term data on what insect populations are doing in Africa anywhere or South America anywhere at all, um, which is pretty scary when you think it's probably where most of the insects live. Um, but we do have some studies, they're few and far between, they tend to be focused on particular groups of insects. But depressingly, they almost all show the same pattern. Um, so, so this is one of them. This is a study I was involved in, but it was conducted in Germany. Um, uh, and it was based on trapping flying insects with malaise traps. That's a, that tent-like thing at the top right there is a malaise trap. And German insect enthusiasts have been putting these on nature reserves since 1989. And the chart shows you the biomass, the weight of insects caught per trap per day from 89 to 2016. And you can see that overall it fell actually on average, it fell by 76%. So three quarters of the flying insects seem to have disappeared from German nature reserves in a, in a 26 year period, which is it's pretty terrifying. It got a lot of news coverage when this came out. Um, but it's, it's far from the only study. Um, I'll, I'll show you a much less well-known one from Germany. Sorry, this is a bit bewildering, this chart. Don't try to <laughs> make too much sense of it. Uh, but this was published in 2019. Um, it's a study of 180 different sites in forests and grasslands. Most of the blue lines and dots are grassland sites. Um, and they plotted various, it's a 10 year study. They plotted various things over time. Um, if you look again at biomass top right there, you can see that between 2008 and 2018, the biomass of both the woodland and the uh, meadow insects declined. Um, so overall biomass was down 67% in grasslands. So in just 10 years, two thirds of the grassland insects seem to have disappeared or the, the weight has declined, which from the point of view of a predator, it's probably the, the total weight that's, that's really important. One thing that's kind of alarming about most of the data we have on insect declines is that they we didn't really start monitoring insects until, at all until quite recently. Um, most of the data sets don't start until the 1970s, 1980s. This one is, is, is much later than that. But so we know almost nothing about what happened before, but there's an interesting study from the Netherlands of butterflies based on museum collections, trying to work out the ranges of butterflies uh, and they estimate that since the turn of the last century, the last 120 odd years, um, butterfly ranges have on average contracted by 80% in the Netherlands. But look at the pattern. Most of that decline happened before 1980, before we actually started any kind of detailed monitoring. So, um, so actually we probably lost a lot of our insects. When industrialized farming began, which was in the early 20th century, um, but we'll never really know because we haven't got any any data. Um, for lots of insects, we don't have a long term monitoring program. We don't have charts over time that we can plot, but we often can construct maps um, and see where they used to be, which is what the, the Dutch study was based on. And I'm just going to show you. Uh, one of my favourite insects and what's happened to it in recent years. So this is the shrill card, a bumblebee, lovely little creature, which um, used to be quite common in the southern half of Britain, um, as you can see there, pre-1960. But as time has gone on, this is just one example. I could have shown you lots of others. Um, it's disappeared. And so by, by the millennium, it was down to about six populations um, clinging on in, in the south of Britain. Um, I first saw it on Salisbury Plain there um, in, in, in 2000. I um, remember getting really excited because the, it's, it's a rare beast and it has this interesting high pitched buzz, which is rather cute, and it, hence the name. Anyway, the Salisbury Plain population has gone extinct since 2000, and very recently the Somerset Levels population went extinct. So this bee is disappearing before our eyes, it's still declining, and it could go extinct within 10 years quite easily. And yeah, the one thing I find rather sad is that most people haven't noticed any of this. Um, 
the one thing that most people have noticed, um, at least if they're old enough to remember, um, is, is this. Um, this is a, a cartoon. You're, most of you will immediately know what I'm talking about. There was a time, exactly when it ended is hard to pinpoint, but there was a time when if you went for a long drive in the summer, your windshield would become opaque with the guts of the insects that you'd hit. Um, and I, I remember it vividly from when I was a teenager, um, but it, does, it doesn't happen anymore. You can drive for hours on a beautiful summer's day and your windscreen remains more or less clear. You might have one or two, um, but, but very few. The, the cartoonist has gone on to predict the likely consequence of these disappearing insects, which um, let's hope is not correct. But, um, but he, he, obviously he's drawing our attention to the fact that these things are really important. Um, before I finish, I thought I ought to mention worms, which are probably an enormously important uh, food source for lots of birds, maybe curlews, um, but they're not insects. A, a lot of these, are, there are loads of other invertebrates that get even less attention than insects, if that's possible. Um, now, there was, there's one recent study on earthworm populations in the UK, which I managed to find. It was published last year. Um, and it was a kind of meta-analysis where they looked at um, data from about 100 different studies published at different times over the last um, 100 years. And uh, from that, they estimated that earthworm abundance on average has fallen by something like 1.6 to 2.1 percent per year. Doesn't sound very much, but obviously over 10 years, over 50 years, that starts to be a huge amount. Um, that, that said, if you look at this chart, which uh, each dot is, a, is, you know, a data point from a field or a woodland somewhere in Britain, um, there are some places with lots of worms in, in the recent past. So there's huge variability, um, which it would be great to understand more about why there are still quite a lot of worms in some places, but on average, far fewer worms than, than they used to be. OK, so that's it from me. If you want to find out more about insect declines, have a look at my book, Silent Earth. And I, it's not entirely depressing, Mary. There are the, the end of it is kind of cheerful and positive what we can do to fix all this. OK, I haven't got, haven't got to that bit yet, Doug. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just a couple of points from me there. That was really interesting. Um, I, too, obviously remember the loads of insects on the windscreen. Uh, and on the headlights, but how much is that car design re responsible for a change that is better wind past it so they don't get splattered so much? Yeah, I mean, that's an obvious point, um, but Kent Wildlife Trust did a, a study specifically on this uh, quite recently. They recruited people with classic cars um, and got them to, and, and also normal cars and compared the two uh, and actually they found exactly the same pattern, even when looking at old fashioned or aerodynamic cars. So uh, that doesn't seem to be the explanation. And the um, we'll go into it in more detail later, but with all the range of insects that you talk about declining, are some groups declining faster than others? Uh, I'll pass. Um, uh, it's hard to say. Um, I think I mean, you could you can pro the only group that I can think of which it seems to be doing OK are um, things like aphids, with crop pests, some species of which are just as abundant as they ever were, if not more so. But they, then they're benefiting from big monocultures of their food. Um, and so, you know, so we shouldn't be surprised that they're thriving. And we, I don't, I think we had a chat beforehand and you said we don't have the data to say that some habitats are faring worse than others, particularly. We don't have the data to support that. No, I don't. I don't think we do. It's you know, the, we've just got a few little tiny kind of windows into what's happening with insects. But for most insects, even in Britain, which where we have the most studied, intensively studied wildlife in the world, I think. Um, I, but even here, you know, apart from butterflies and more recently bumblebees and moths, we don't have long-term monitoring for any of our other insect groups really. So, amazing. Yeah. It'd be hard to. Lovely. Thank you, Dave. Um, we'll move on to Wietzer, who, um, as I said, um, studies 
brown nesting birds, not just curlew, I think if that's right, we'd say, um, the diet in, in the Netherlands, which uh, is, for those of you who haven't been to the Netherlands, it's quite surprising when you go there because it, the intensity of the farmland is quite eye-watering. So, um, and yet, uh, in some ways, uh, the, the, the Dutch are really trying to get on top of trying to protect their ground nesting birds, even in this very challenging environment. But I won't take any more of your time, Lisa, because I'm dying to hear what you've got to say. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Mary. Th thanks for the invitation. Um, um, I indeed did a, um, a research project this uh, last summer about um, potential role of diet um, in the um, well, habitat use of uh, curlew chicks. It, it wasn't specifically about what they actually eat, but rather food availability in the modern landscape. Um, yeah, my project was supervised by Raymond Klaassen and Henk Jan Ottens from the Montague Harrier Foundation. And Christian Bot uh, was the examiner. So when you think of the Netherlands, you think of mostly really large uh, agricultural fields, like you said. Um, my study area was right here. Uh, can you see the mouse? Mouse pointer. Um, well, ba basically in Drenthe, um, there's uh, one of the la last hotspots of the curlew. Um, and this uh, in this area, you can kind of uh, notice four main kinds of habitat use. First, there's the arable land, of course, and these fields are huge. Uh, in the photo, you can see a um, a the border between a maize and potato field that's about a kilometer long, and it's uh, all barren. And this is right at the moment where the eggs are hatching, basically in May. On the top left, you see intensive grassland, which is uh, um, which are also huge fields of just um, English ryegrass monocultures, and these tend to be mown very often and uh, injected with manure. Um, and these two are by far the most common type of land use in this province and all throughout the Netherlands, I'd say. On the bottom, you can see. Um, extensive grassland where um, where cows tend to graze um, and uh, on the uh, bottom left you can see um, natural grasslands which, which is what we Dutch call natural those are usually quite small fields that we don't uh, use until the birds have basically uh, flown or fledged I mean um, so these um, tend to um, um, have a lot of uh, vegetation on them basically because they are not mown or grazed. And the extensive and natural grasslands, they are quite rare. So how has the curlew been doing uh, in this landscape? Well, not very well. We've lost um, since 1984 around 70% of the breeding population in the Netherlands and this uh, trend needs to stop quickly. <laughs> um, and what my project was about was to indeed um, kind of uh, begin to um, map out what's available in terms of food, because um, like I said, sometimes um, you find uh, chicks that haven't actually been uh, well, eaten at all, so they might, they might uh, die of starvation. Um, and we actually know very little about what they eat. We do know that adults primarily uh, feed on soil, dwell soil dwelling organisms, but not exclusively, and that the chicks gather their own food. Um, but what exactly they eat, we don't know. I did find some data on the uh, chicks of long billed curlews in uh, America, which primarily uh, pointed to grasshoppers and carabid beetles as their primary food source. So, what we did. Um, was we followed uh, 38 curlew chicks in order to map their uh, habitat use and their survival throughout the season. We also took uh, biometric measurements, um, but uh, for the sake of time, I'll be uh, I'll be skipping over those. We um, located these chicks with uh, this transmitter every week, um, 
And on the bottom left, you can see Henk Jan uh, Ottens, my supervisor with one of those antennas. Um, and basically, you have to be very careful not to step on one, because in the photo on the uh, bottom right, you can see that there are two hidden over there, and they're pretty hard to spot. Uh, I did arthropod trapping on uh, nine fields in total. I had three different uh, field types, uh, arable land, intensive grass, and natural. Uh, I didn't get to sample on any extensive grass, uh, grasslands, unfortunately. Um, I had a malaise strap for flying arthropods, which is this little tent structure, and I used five, a row of five pitfall traps um, to catch ground-dwelling arthropods. And I uh, basically put them in alcohol and to identify them. Uh, the identification, I, um, I used only three of those uh, samples. I removed the outliers first, and then I did the uh, caribid beetles down to species level. Other beetle families I did down to family level and everything else down to order. And the um, Malay strap samples or the flying insects were only weighed. I then uh, did an analysis in uh, the R software where I calculated um, abundances of caribid beetles, um, their, their species richness, so how many species do you catch in a sample. I also calculated the Shen Diversity Index and Simpson's Evenness, which take into account uh, how evenly distributed those, uh, spe how evenly represented, I mean, those species are. And I calculated uh, average stock biomass and beetle length as well, or size. So the uh, chick survival this year was actually quite good. Uh, almost one in four survived this year, which is um, quite good the two years before that were um, disasters so it's good to see uh, a good year once again in terms of habitat use in uh, figure a i mapped out the uh, habitat use of the curlew families throughout uh, the breeding season um, relative to their age so what you see is that uh, many of, well there's a lot of use of intensive grasslands and they tend to uh, not switch all that much between different types of uh, field. But when they switch, they tend to switch towards intensive grasslands, which I found quite um, interesting. Um, this is despite the fact that uh, in figure B, I mapped out the availability of these different uh, types for, um, for the families. And so a quarter of the families could, in theory, go towards a natural grassland, but uh, only one of them did. Um, and that wasn't even a, um, that, that, that was a forced relocation by volunteers. So that one doesn't even really count. Um, um, you know, like I said, um, the natural and extensive grasslands tend to be found in islands, um, which, um, I mapped out in the figure on the right, where I highlighted uh, four uh, natural grassland fields in just a sea of um, monocultures, essentially. Um, I found some rare species with the uh, beetles. Um, four of them were quite rare. My personal favorite was this one, the Agonum viridicupleum. It's very colorful, great to look at. <laughs> Um, also found two that were quite special, Amara culti, which um, was only found on natural grasslands, and the rarest one I found was the Agonum gracilipes, which curiously was found primarily on intensive grasslands. I found quite a lot of them, so this one appears to be making a bit of a comeback. Next, I want to be talking about abundance and diversity of the um, samples. Uh, in the graphs, I've colored the different field types. Uh, basically, red is uh, arable fields, uh, green is the intensive grasslands, and uh, blue are the natural grasslands. And what we see is a significantly higher abundances of uh, beetles in um, the intensive grassland and natural grasslands over the arable fields, which can be seen by these, uh, by those, oh, by those uh, stars over here. But curiously, in richness, I found no difference between the fields. 
And uh, neither did I find any differences in terms of Shannon Diversity Index on the top or Simpson's evenness. In terms of biomass, I found some uh, interesting patterns. Um, the flying insects were um, had a lot more biomass available on the intensive grasslands, cu curiously, when compared to arable lands with the natural grasslands kind of in between. And those couldn't really be um, differentiated from the other types. When it came to uh, the ground dwelling insects, there we see that the natural grasslands leap ahead of the other two um, habitat types. Then the average size of the beetles I found to be significantly smaller on intensive grasslands compared to the other two field types, which um, might actually be relevant for the curly chicks, which I'll come back to. So in conclusion, um, we had a good curly year last year, may this year um, be good, a good one as well. It appears that natural grasslands are better in terms of prey availability compared to the other two. However, they are not specifically drawn to these grasslands. And um, this appears to indicate that prey availability does not uh, steer their habitat selection. About the uh, beetle size, I thought that that one might actually be an important factor to take into account in future um, analyses because this right here, this is a uh, Carabus granulatus, which is one of the largest species. As you can see, it's on it's uh, on scale of uh, two scale, sorry, with the chick below it. And um, given that it's as big as its beak, I wonder if it's even capable of swallowing such a large beetle as these things are built like tanks and need to be swallowed whole. So, um, yeah, that was it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Witsa. Fascinating stuff. It's very good. OK, that is so much information in those three talks and some very, very interesting questions are appearing also in the chat. I'm going to go first of all, we'll just have a quick discussion amongst ourselves and then we'll open it out to some of the questions. But but Rachel, any indication, what, what's your hunch as to why they're picking certain parts of fields and not others? Have you got any gut feeling about that? Um, oh, I have a whole pile of theories um, which have been developing really fast over the last half an hour, I have to say. <laughs> so um, one of them is going to be about um, the things that will predict accessibility, particularly of earthworms. So th for adult curlew, um, there's a very strong relationship between soil temperature, soil moisture, time of day and where um, earthworms are found in the soil column. So if you can only probe to three inches depth or less if it's very compacted soil, you can't get hold of earthworms if they've gone further down into the soil because it's very dry, because it's very hot. We're getting very hot summers. So for adults, they're almost certainly going to be choosing places where they can get their bills into the soil and where the soil is cool enough and damp enough that the earthworms stay high in the soil and they can still reach them. Um, in the bogs, probably water depth is going to be quite important because you get lots of leather jackets, um, insect larvae and things in the top layers of, of bog if, if that's above water level. And obviously a lot of these invertebrates are not going to live in completely saturated um, sphagnum moss so that sort of keep them close to the surface but again if the water level drops the invertebrates will drop through the through the moss as well and rapidly go out of reach so my suspicion is that 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 will account for a lot of adult behavior so even in a field where it looks like one big single field they can vary that much between one side and another that's what you're finding yeah Absolutely. And you can see that if you look at the tracks um, in, in certainly in Wales, where we have much lumpier fields. Um, the, you, if you if you see a curly track across uh, 
a tractor track across a field, you'll notice in places the, the wheels are digging much deeper ruts and those will be uncompacted and damper areas of the field. Um, you know, even in the same field, you'll get quite strong differences. And slope and aspect and soil depth will also change how quickly the soil heats and how, how quickly it dries out through the season as well. And have you noticed the curlews going more to uh, wildflower meadows as opposed to just grassland? You see what I mean? Just grass. Um, in mixed landscapes, um, the adults seem to feed wherever the grass is short enough that they can get access to surface living invertebrates. So that can actually be in intensive silage fields, particularly early in the season. Curly don't like to be in vegetation that's taller than they are when they're feeding. They're very alert. So if it's still short, they'll, the adults will feed very happily in very intensive grassland um, and in the patchier stuff and in complex grazed areas. The chicks and certainly curlew nests are always in places where the vegetation is more complex and do seem to be in wetter areas as well. So I wonder whether the placement of a curlew nest in a complex landscape is a better indicator of chick feeding habitat because the adults will travel a long way to feed and the chicks are not going to travel nearly as well, certainly initially. And the... Um the length of the bills of the males and females, are you finding that they're separating out and males feed in some areas? Because males have shorter bills than females on the whole. Right? They do. In, in the breeding season, I, male behaviour is much more complicated than, than where they can feed um, because males take on most of the territorial behaviour, most of the chick guarding behaviour. Um, females tend to leave when the chicks are less than a week old. Um, they've, they've done their bit and they fold up and head back to the beaches. Um, and in some areas, particularly in more complex landscapes, we often see males leaving their breeding territory altogether at night and going somewhere else completely. So those signals make it very confusing to try and separate um, feeding locations for a pair because the pair are behaving very differently. So... If, if I gave you a little fairy magic wand and you could wave it um, and you could have your wish granted, what is the, you most want to understand about the relationship between curlews and food from with your with Ooh, I, I, <laughs> I'd like to study the small invertebrates of, of around the the nest areas and the chick feeding areas and the relationship of their availability to birds so you know it's insect behavior as much as anything um, against things like changing weather patterns changing rainfall patterns and changing land use because there's this terrible tension with dense vegetation that chicks um, can hide in it but when the springs are very wet and the grass is saturated, chicks can get saturated and they can die of cold very quickly. But it also provides much more complex places for invertebrates to hide. And therefore, it's a three dimensional landscape that chicks can reach. So there's better food and there's a there's a lot of complicated stuff going on there. Um, I'm less concerned about adults food resources because mm -hmm. adults are Catholic with a small c they, they can eat a much wider variety of things they can reach a wider variety of things and they can fly so they can exploit dispersed resources hmm. thank you Dave um the uh, I mean it's your book um silent earth is, is so um is so worrying in terms of the sheer war we're waging against insect life on earth do you want to give us um, an indication of uh, the background as to how how much more insecticide we're using than we did, say, 50 years ago? Yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, pe pesticides haven't actually been around that long, really. I mean, they, they mostly appeared in the wake of the Second World War. Um, so about 80 years ago, but there were only a very tiny number available to start with. Um, 
and they were seen as a kind of magic bullet that you know crop yields jumped up no one it didn't occur to anyone that there might be kind of collateral damage or any other harms associated we just went gung-ho and started using them all around the world things like ddt and the early organophosphates um and it didn't take long you know, rachel carson published silent spring in 1962 so over 60 years ago now, and only really 20 years after pesticides started being used, it became obvious to her that farmers were being poisoned, livestock was being poisoned, and uh, wildlife was dying and so on. Um, and of course, she was right, and, and some of those early pesticides were eventually banned as a result of her, her drawing attention to them. Um, but, you know, I, Rachel Carson would, would Bull in their grave if she knew what had happened since you know when when she published silent spring i think i'm right in saying there were 37 pesticide different pesticide compounds available um in america today in america there are about a thousand different pesticides available and some of them are thousands of times more toxic than than ddt for example um it's not quite so bad in europe we we have a a better regulatory system than anywhere in the world, but it's still pretty shit, if I'll be blunt. Um, it fails us repeatedly. And we have, there's still something like 500 different pesticides available to European farmers. Um, and if you look at, you know, for example, in the UK, we have some good data on um, the number of applications to oilseed rape and how they've changed over time. And they've tripled in the last 25 years. So every year we use more and more um, both on a national and an international scale. So yeah, uh, it's pretty terrifying. If you, um, it, if you, do you know of any studies, have you looked at uh, the, the curlews that are nesting in silage fields, for example? Um, is that a particularly bad environment for, for insects? Is that what you're finding? Fewer there than well, anywhere else? That, if, that wouldn't be probably much to do with pesticides. Um, silage fields are pretty poor for insects just because they tend to be monocultures of one plant, which means there's, unless you happen to eat ryegrass, there's just nothing for you as an insect. So um, yeah, you know, they're going to be pretty, pretty poor. Mm. From what you've heard of, of from what Wietse and, and Rachel have said, have you got any um, any comments from from the sort of with insect eyes, if you like, looking at the curlew? Would you hazard a guess that you think insects could be an, uh, something well worth looking at for curlews and chicks? I must admit, I always thought curlews ate worms. I, I, I forgive me as a non-bird person, um, you know, the long bill and everything. And I had no idea that I never thought about the fact that chicks have tiny little bills in comparison. And clearly. I'm not feeding on worms much or at all. Um, and it seems as if actually insects are the, are the, are the key, at least for chick survival. Um, mm -hmm. Whether there are particular insects that they prefer and that are more critical um, would be, you know, do they, is it beetles, is it flies, is it caterpillars? It would be kind of interesting to know. Um, spiders, I think. The, ma well. the measures, sorry, go on. So those spiders, I said as well, are very important. Yeah, yeah, but the the measures we might take to help them would work for all of them. You know, we need to reduce ploughing, reduce pesticide inputs, um, move to a. I mean, broadly, I would argue that the whole agricultural system needs completely overhauling and changing direction. I don't think it's sustainable. You know, curlews are just one example of of the wildlife which is being exterminated globally by the way we farm. And in fact, I was interested to hear in your in your book, Silent Earth, that uh, there is a relationship between the disappearance of farm and birds and insect decline, a correlation. And you talk about the grey partridge. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of examples of, of bird species that um, have declined and it, it tends to be, obviously there are exceptions, but usually insect specialist bird feeding uh, birds have declined more. If you think everything from like, cuckoos have declined, they're spe specialised in feeding on hairy caterpillars. Nightingales have declined hugely. A lot of uh, swifts have declined hugely. Of course, there may, there may be other issues. Of what's happening. The grey partridge is a nice example where there's really good evidence.
are really heavily dependent on um, on insects and their decline is directly linked to the decline of insect abundance. Yeah. Um, wait, sir, for, um, if I understood your graphs and things properly, so it's quite surprising that the natural grasslands, the, the sort of more natural areas of which, as you said, there aren't very many, are just not that popular with, with curlew and other ground nesting birds. Yeah, that's true. I, I have kind of two uh, different theories on why that is. Um, um, first of all, my project doesn't really exclude uh, random movement because there are so um, there's so few of that that if a cur curlew decides to walk in a random direction, that the chance of it ending up in intensive grassland is of course much higher than it ending up in the na natural uh, grassland. Secondly, um, the vegetation tends to also get very uh, dense on those fields. And like Rachel said before, that curlews don't like to be in um, dense vegetation. Am I right? That, so I, I think that might actually be an issue with those fields uh, particularly. Now, I have heard from, um, from uh, Henk Jan that um, data from previous years does um, also show that they will use natural grasslands. So it could be a bit of an anomaly that they didn't decide to this year, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you found a difference between where there was more flying insects than there were ground insects. <clears throat> Can you just clarify it's, that? Bit? It's a bit curious. Um, with the flying insects, I found that there were more on intensive grasslands than on arable farmland, but the natural grasslands were kind of stuck in the middle. I don't really know why. But once again, um, just with how small those fields are, um, the um, area around it is, of course, also um, will plays a um, plays a role in how much how many insects you're going to find on a field, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, with the nature fields being so being confined to these small islands, there they might just be too small for a meaningful um, uh, flying population of insects to form there. Could be. Yeah. Um, when I met you out in in the middle of the field, you were delighted when a little curly chick pooed on you because you collected it immediately. <laughs> Have you done any analysis of, of what was in there? Do you know, have you got any indication of what they're eating mainly? Yeah, those samples uh, were not fit for use, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, th there are plans to do a large scale um, analysis on fecal samples of curly chicks in the future. And um, well, basically, um, I'm, I uh, have contact with the uh, person who's going to be doing that in the future. Uh, Georgette Lagerdijk is her name. And um, well, she's going to be more clear in the future on how to exactly achieve a good sample. So, <laughs> so that's on the way. OK, but in the Netherlands, I think it's so dominated by intensive grassland, isn't it? That everything must must be in yeah. its shadow. I mean, it's it's just one big intensive field, really uh, large parts of it. Not being yeah, I, I haven't known important. any different throughout my childhood. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I think of how it, how it used to be, I, I used to think that a green mat of grass was nature. <laughs> mm. Until yeah. I learned otherwise. Yeah, but when you talk to the older generation, they remember a very different, a different yeah. system. So what has changed, say, in your parents and grandparents' time, do you think? Um, well, the... Um, the agriculture has been increasingly intensifying and the the herbs were taken out of the field, the cows were taken out of the field in exchange for the mower and um, the liquid manure injector. And I, I, I feel like that has been a, um, let's just say, that, that hasn't been kind on the rest of the, all of the living things that were uh, in the grass on before. Mm. Uh, there was yeah. this astonishing photograph that I think the Henk Jan uh, sent me of 
a curlew nesting in this tiny little tuft of grass, vast, empty. And yet that chick, that, that curlew managed to raise two chicks. And I think the idea was it led its chicks in, into a ditch, um, a sort of drainage channel where there is longer, more natural vegetation, I suppose, with insects in it. So it might not be that they need very particular things. They just have to have access to food. Is that the right would that be right? I mean, it was an amazing photograph. I'll, I'll try and find it and put it, share it so people can see it. Yeah, which one is it? Uh, I'd love to see it. You uh, kind of dropped out halfway and so I don't know okay. where it was reading, <laughs> where the nest was. Okay, uh, well, while I find it and I'll put it up. Um, Megan, can you uh, give us some of the questions that are coming in on the chat? So there's one here about um, crane fly larvae, also known as leather jackets. Concerns have been raised over the loss of moist pastures um, and crane fly larva due to improved drainage of fields. And it's an ongoing problem. Plagues of, or oh, now bear, my, bear with this pronunciation, tipula olerithia larvae, which require moist conditions and now a thing of the past. These big larvae would have been great food items for curlies, probably now partially replaced by tipula paludosa, which can tolerate conditions in drier pastures, but still require moist conditions. Do you have anything to comment on that, Dave? Uh, sorry, uh, my knowledge of crane flies is quite limited, I must admit. <laughs> Um, I mean, they obviously, they're, we know they're really important food. I've, I've come across them in the context of starling decline, where people have linked that to crane fly. Leather, leather jacket is the common name for the grubs that live under the ground. But a but, far fewer leather crane flies around, aren't there? I mean, yeah, one, and they used to be wandering in houses at night, didn't they? And, but uh, I, I get very few these days. Would that be anything that you've come across, Witsa, the crane fly larvae? And, and diet? Um, I did find a couple in my pitfall traps, but that's about it. And that's all I, I, I haven't read anything about those specifically, no. And Rachel? Yeah, there's, that's an interesting one. So I wouldn't expect you to catch them in pitfall traps, Sweetser, because the larvae tend to be subterranean, so they, they don't spend any time on the surface. Um, Certainly in Wales, even in the, how long have I been in Wales? Call it 20 years, something like that. Um, I've noticed that, that several species used to have a big surge of crane fly feeding in sort of mid to late summer when there was this mass emergence, when they, the soil was warm enough. Um, and we're not seeing that now. It used to make, make things quite difficult for me because crane fly are a great um, species to use as bait in a trap. But when there are you know, thousands of them in every direction. Your birds are not that interested in the trap. Um, and I was finding leather jackets in all of the grassland and bog habitats in the places where I've um, been working on curlew, um, but at much lower densities and farmers don't like them. Um, I don't know what it is specifically they have against leather jackets, but they don't like them. And if they think that there are too many of them in their grassland, that's something that the grassland is treated for. So presumably they cause root damage or something like yeah, that. So they are herbivores, yeah, they eat the roots of the grass, so they would reduce the fuel perhaps a tiny bit if there were lots and lots of them. Yeah, people commonly will pay to have their lawns treated to kill leather jackets, which I always find particularly sad. Yeah. Megan, is there another question that you that's come in in the chat? Yeah, so sticking with insect decline, um, David Jackson said a few years ago, I recall seeing an article in the British Birds magazine by a Dutch researcher noting that cows which had been inoculated made pats that were so sterile that yellow wagtails found much less food. And I presume this affects curlews as well. Who wants to comment yeah. on that? Um, I'm happy to. Uh, so the pesticides used by arable farmers have come under a lot of scrutiny in recent years uh, in terms of driving insect declines, but there's been much less attention paid to the, to the various parasiticides that are either applied to livestock on the outside or fed to them and 
come out in their in their poo basically but we know there's things like um, avermectins which are really toxic to invertebrates generally that's why they used to deworm cattle and horses and sheep and so on but it means that the, the the poo they produce is basically poisonous to to the creatures that would naturally recycle it as i mentioned earlier um and probably that has a pretty devastating Im impact on um insect abundance in in livestock keeping areas like the west of Britain. Rachel? Yeah, this is this is definitely a concern of mine, um, particularly because in the upland areas that are the heartland of breeding curlew in Wales, of course, there was a, a very abrupt shift between treating um, sheep with external with with dips, which are short term and non systemic. Um, and farmers had to, for very good reasons, switched from using these incredibly toxic dips, which were killing farmers, and switched to using persistent worming treatments in sheep, which don't have the same impacts on farmers, but are very persistent. And there are the, the dosing regime for worming sheep is something that is very inflexible. If you're selling lambs to market, they have to be wormed at certain intervals and they have to be kept on pasture for a certain period before they go to market. Um, and those pastures are places where curlew are feeding. Um, and of course, it's happening at exactly the time when there are um, pre-fledging chicks wandering around. Well, the few chicks that are wandering around are, are feeding in those fields. Having said that, um, I've seen a pattern in these mixed landscapes where when sheep are put onto a pasture, the curlew follow about two weeks later. So clearly there are things that are surviving in their droppings because you see lots of crunchy little beetles. And I, forgive me, Dave, I don't know what they are, but I can describe them to you. Um, and curlew feed very, very rapidly and very enthusiastically on these things because they're a nice size to be picked up and they're at very high densities on the surface. Um, but what impact any of those chemical traces are having on the curlew long term is another question. Wait, so do, are the cattle, um, do they, uh, are they treated with ivermectin and then is then that then sprayed all over the fields and these huge great big side, you know, dung injectors into the soil? Um, I couldn't tell you. I I know very little about pesticides, unfortunately. Okay, because that would be worth finding out, wouldn't it? Because you know it's astonishing to watch these massive machines just full of sort of slurry just being going right, just injecting it into the soils. You know what, three four times a year or something. Um, and if mm -hmm. they've got chemicals in them, that, that goodness knows what's happening to the soils. Yep. <laughs> if I can add, um, Anna in the chat has said faecal egg counts prior to worming of cattle and sheep are much more common now, meaning that dosing is less frequent. I also wanted to add that um, Sally Ann Spence, who is an entomologist, is doing quite a lot of work on dung beetles and working with farmers to promote um well dung beetles <laughs> and how wonderful they are so hopefully that's i think she's based in oxfordshire or thereabouts and she does quite a bit with them uh shall we move on to another question yeah. yeah this one's from roger which might have a, a positive slant to it um he says are some bees and wasps and i guess some other insects as well thermophiles who might eventually benefit a bit from climate change if we stop drowning them in chemicals? Dave? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, and absolutely, there are quite a lot of insects that are thermophilic that, that, that will benefit from warming, all else being equal. Um, uh, and we've seen a few new arrivals come in Britain from into Britain in recent decades from further south, probably because of the temperature. The, 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 Difficulty is that it, it tends to be a small number of highly mobile generalist species, which often includes pest species that can take advantage of warming climates because they need to be mobile. They need to be able to find some, something to eat, a suitable habitat when they get further north, uh, if they fly across the channel or whatever. Um, so it tends to be um, a, a very small number of species that, that benefit and the more specialist species 
the species of insect that are tied to particular habitats that really struggle to move with the climate because they've got a, they've basically got a sort of leapfrog from one little stepping stone of habitat to another. So if you think of a butterfly that lives in Heathland, for example, it might be able to expand northwards as it gets warmer, but if there's no Heathland there, or the next bit of Heathland is 300 miles away across cities and farm fields and whatever, it's, it's very unlikely to get there unless it's an extraordinarily mobile species. So yes, there are a few winners in, in, in terms of climate change, but unfortunately, probably more losers. Sorry to, uh, to shatter the hopes that there was a bit of positivity <laughs> going to creep in there. There are some good things happening in the world, honestly. <laughs> There are, there definitely are. Megan? Okay, so bringing it back to Curlews, Witzer, is your thesis now published? You said that biometrics were taken. Did you find much variation in chick develop development between nestmates, i.e. did some siblings grow much faster than others, or was there a significant difference between chick development from nest to nest, perhaps related to the different nest locations and habitats? Um, let's see, um, I can show the figure if you want. Um, yes, do. Because basically these are the growth curves I made. Uh, I, what I did is I compared uh, between years, but um, so basically in black we've got, um, we've got last year. Um, so yeah, as, as you can see, there is some variability when it comes to uh, different chicks. However, I haven't looked specifically at uh, siblings or something like that. Um, and it's it's not, um, my thesis is not published. No, it's, um, I, I am thinking about doing it, but I just haven't got the time, honestly. <laughs> but I would like to. So you haven't come across any um, difference between uh, insect rich, insect poor areas. You can't correlate those to chick size or chick rate of growth. Yeah, the, the problem is that um, these, these chicks this year tended to stay mostly in intensive grassland, so I can't really compare. That, that's, that's the issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have we got anything like that, Rachel? Any indication of that? Oh, no, um, we not yet. Um, I know that RSPB is doing some work on chick development and chick diet and their movement patterns in some of these complex landscapes, but I'm not aware that any of that's been published. Um, so that would certainly be very, very interesting. Um, yeah. I do. Can I can I ask which a question? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Of course. All your your locations of chicks um was based on um on relocating radio tags so presumably you located them always in the daytime because people tend to do that kind of thing in the daytime and they can yeah. see what's going on sure. um so that that's really interesting and i would love if that study was repeated for for there to be some chick location work overnight because there's a really strong diurnal behavioral pattern in curlew um okay. Certainly in adults and certainly right through the chick guarding period. So, you know, you'd expect it to be the same for the chicks that they're in different places at night and doing slightly different things. And I wonder if aerial insects are more accessible to curly chicks at night because they aren't flying overnight and they'll be resting on the vegetation. That's true. I'll, um, I'll pass it on to uh, my supervisors because next year someone else will probably take this over and I'll um, make sure that they take it into account. Fantastic, thank, thank you. you. Can we go on to the next question? Yep, so um, let me just find the one. Um, curlews tend to be loyal and return to same locations to breed, um, perhaps why they try and continue to breed in improved intensive grassland despite the challenges with vehicle movements and early silage cuts. If they continue to fail, I can't say this, if they continue to fail to fledge chicks year on year, will they try new locations? 
I think I'm going to hand that straight over to Rachel. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I thought you might do that. OK, um, so I'll start by saying that our data here are somewhat limited because it's only been possible to track breeding curlew to with the sort of spatial resolution that we need for this kind of question since 2016. And in fact, the vast majority of it has been done since 2018 and 19. Um, I piloted it in 2016, so um, it's a very new science. And what that means is that we don't have very much information on the same bird in successive years, partly because curly really don't like being caught twice, thank you very much, um, and partly because tag technology is developing incredibly fast at the moment and we're only just really in the last three years or so able to have tags that last that long so that we can look at a bird in successive years. Um, so that's a limitation to what we know. Um, the next thing that we know from colour mark studies and from the small amount of data that we have for, for the same bird in multiple years um, is that certainly breeding males are incredibly sight faithful to the meters in some cases. Um, I have a, a very famous curlew who's back on his breeding territory this year, whose nest is within 10 meters of the same place every year. Um, I also have um, track data from birds who were mowed out of their first, second and third breeding attempts in the same corner of the same field. Um, and without being too anthropomorphic about it, because it's very easy to be anthropomorphic, but this is a species which is long lived. And that means that they are, they're conservative, small c conservative. They will do the same thing again and again. If it worked once, they're gonna keep doing that because the risks associated with, with doing something very different are bigger than the risks of failing this year, but succeeding next year. So it's in a curlew's um, evolutionary interest to do the same thing this year as it did last year. Things change when they lose a partner or when the, the habitat use is, change is so extreme that the bird just doesn't recognise it as breeding habitat at all. So a housing estate, it wouldn't try in, it would move. But silage looks like prairie grassland, it looks like good stuff and they will keep trying. They don't seem to learn from losing their chicks because their view is always the long one of maybe it'll be OK next year. I think that's one of the best explanations I've heard, actually, for, for why they keep coming back. Megan is going to try because I'm completely useless uh, and show that picture. There we go. Can everyone see it? That is a curlew nesting in a field in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And if you can look. Carefully, can you uh, do you know this photo, Lisa? No, I haven't seen this one yet. No, uh, but do you have an idea where it is? Or the sort of well, I, I do remember one that bred in a um, in a maize field. I don't know if it's this one because the the background is kind of blurry. But that particular one, they um, after hatching immediately moved to a uh, intensive grassland field right next door. <laughs> And they actually did manage to raise one, so mm. that was quite cool. Fact, and uh, uh, whether it's the same one or not, but uh, Heng Yan told me that um, they often take the, they immediately take the chicks to these drainage ditches, which have uh, damper vegetation with some uh, insects in it. Um, and as long as they're within a certain distance and the little tiny chicks can get there, they can make it, which shows, I think, how incredibly adaptable they can be if we just put a few of the right building blocks in place, uh, obviously it wouldn't. What, what amazes me is it, it, it not only does it survive the mower, it's been, it's been flagged, so hopefully the, the great big machine won't go over it. But you'd think a fox yeah. or something or a bird of prey would spot that no problem. Wouldn't you? <laughs> of course, the, the curlew does kind of uh, blend in with the bare soil, so yeah. it's got that going for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, yeah. Have we got any last couple of questions, Megan? Oh, 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 I think we're almost at time. So I, I think... was going to say we've got two minutes left, so probably not. <laughs> but there were some really good ones in the chat. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. There's not one more that we can do. Oh, all right. Let's try and squeeze one more in. Um, 
if I can find it. OK, um, I'm curious to learn whether the Cullies use the intensive grasslands more or less relative to their availability. Natural grasslands are more scarce in surface. Area, yeah. We yeah that's, that's definitely possible. Yeah. So it's just they're using it because there's more of it, basically. It's as simple as that. Yeah, which would yeah. imply that they don't really discriminate between the natural and intensive grasslands when they walk around. They just, and as long as they stick to grasslands, that they're basically happy, I guess. <laughs> OK, I'm going to. Um... Thank you, everybody. Some really good questions and there's some more in there. This will be available uh, and recorded afterwards if you want to go back and look at the presentations again. But I am going to just go back. I've already given Rachel her magic wand, so she's answered it. So I'm going to give, pass it now, Rachel, down to Dave. Um, I think I know what you're going to say, Dave, but how would you rectify the, the problems that we're having? not only for curly, but all sorts of wildlife. Wave the wand and what would you most want to do and what would you most want to find out? Ah, crikey, there are so many things I could say. Um, actually, probably not what you expected. I, I would. I wish government would properly introduce elms and make it work with the agro-environment scheme. It seems like hardly any farmers have bought into it. It's not really working. It sounded really good when Michael Gove announced it four or five years ago, but they've watered it down and messed it about and basically made a complete hash of it as far as I can see. And that was quite exciting and did have the potential to, to push farming in a more sustainable direction, I thought. OK, good. All right. Wait, sir. Um, when it comes to what we can do, to kind of get the curlew and all other kinds of birds and insects back. Um, yeah, probably um, for the insects, it would be great, of course, if we stop spraying so many pesticides everywhere. Um, but I, I don't really know if um, it's the insects that are the limiting factor for the curlew. Um, yeah, it, Quite, quite honestly, I don't think we've got enough information to uh, know. What, what, what I did see during the study was that um, the rural families tend to stick close to the edge of the field because um, that, uh, there tends to be a little more vegetation left than in the middle after it's mown. And it appears that they just need yeah, it's a hunch that they just need more cover to hide, basically. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's it. Mm. I'd, I'd certainly agree with you from my from visiting the Netherlands. Uh, mm. Cover is not is not very in, in great supply. Nope. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, Wietzer and Dave uh, for leading us through this really thorny issue. Just hot off the press. I know I'm running over slightly. Um, it looks like the uh, public consultation for the GCSE and natural history will be announced imminently and as we'll put it, putting it on our website. It'll be all over the place. We'll make sure it's all over the place. And that means that everybody can have their say in what goes into the GCSE and natural history. And as you know, until we have a more nature literate society, these problems are just going to get worse and not go away and we'll be far better equipped to deal with them if we all understand, more curious, more uh, determined to find out how to make a healthier world. So that's um, just a heads up that that's coming up soon. But for tonight, thank you to Rachel Wietzer and Dave, fantastically interesting webinar. And thank you for so many people to uh, for joining us tonight. And we'll see you for the next one. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. bye.